Hi, I'm delighted to be here with my good friend, Jackie Holder, and neighbour, South London neighbour. Absolutely. Here in your wonderful home, by the way. Thank, Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's the first time I've been here. Most people don't let me into their homes. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to come again. <laughs> so, coach, trainer, author, interfaith minister. It's been quite a journey, I get the feeling, and you've just published your most recent of your three books, um, 90, uh, 49 Ways to Write Yourself Well. 90 is the next book. Isn't that sort of yeah. 90? But there's so much, there's so much richer, yeah. it could almost be that. And um, where did your story begin? Because I know you're a South London girl. How did life start from the South London girl coach in the early days of coaching, mm. interfaith minister? How did, tell us a little bit about your background and your story of what led you to get to where you are now. Well, I'll try and keep it brief, mm -hmm. but I was just thinking, you asked me that question, how did it all start? Mm -hmm. And for me, it really began um, as a, a child growing up in West Norwood, which right. is just like two or three miles from here, right. and remembering the summer holidays mm -hmm. and where all my friends wanted to go out and play. I always had pen, paper, colouring pencils, wow. and was always thinking of some project, whether it was pressing flowers in a book, mm -hmm. you know, making up stories. Mm -hmm. I just felt a freedom mm -hmm. to express mm -hmm. myself on the page. And Did you I, feel so you didn't have that freedom elsewhere? Or were, you, or were you just drawn to the page? That's really, that's really an interesting question because I think that that must have been the case mm -hmm. where I didn't feel there was a freedom mm -hmm. because of um, the family history, the stories mm -hmm. of our life in the, the, the late 1960s, the mm -hmm. early 1970s. I clearly found an outlet mm -hmm. for myself mm -hmm. um, where I felt that I could be myself, that I could express myself mm -hmm. and actually gave me a bit of safety. Quite, yeah. I think that's what pen and paper did for me. Mm -hmm. It actually gave me quite a considerable amount of safety mm -hmm. where I felt unsafe. Mm -hmm. and, and lots of people growing up, um, 60s, 70s, um, particularly the first generation of many black families in the UK, mm -hmm. for example, among other families, things weren't necessarily easy. They weren't easy. About, what was the, what's your up that bringing light? Well, it's... It's a, it's a story that is very familiar mm -hmm. for many um, families that are from African Caribbean mm -hmm. um, backgrounds mm -hmm. and African backgrounds. My parents, my dad came over here in the late 1950s. His mm -hmm. brother came over before him. Right. My brother, his brother then sponsored him to come to the UK. Mm -hmm. He settled in Clapham mm -hmm. in South, South, South London, South West. Mm -hmm. My mum then came over, but she'd already had two children with my dad. And those two children were left in Barbados with my grandmother, mm -hmm. and one was under six months old. Yeah. My mum came to the UK. She then subsequently felt instantly pregnant with myself. Mm -hmm. So she really didn't have an opportunity to settle into the country. Mm -hmm. um, and before she knew it, she had a, a newborn baby. Mm -hmm. And apparently I was quite a robust <laughs> child, you yeah. know, like expressing yeah. myself, yeah. not in a, a, a negative way, yeah. but I was, I, I, I think I came out quite inquisitive about oh, life. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think that inquisitiveness has been there throughout, I get that feeling from, from knowing you and from hearing you and talk about your work and, and generally, is that fair to say, that inquisitive, have you always been interested in life? I mean, clearly you said whether you were you know, pressing um, things in the book or, you know, picking up the pen, paper, were you always inquisitive and curious about what's going on in the world around you? I think I was, mm. because I can remember occasions when at the family, we used to have dinner around a big table every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we grew up with some lovely traditions mm -hmm. in our, our home, despite there being a little bit of disorder and chaos. Right and uh, trauma thrown yeah. in, let's just throw in the yeah. menu, yeah. Um, there was actually quite a, a very strong cultural tradition mm -hmm. which um, have really served me well mm -hmm. as I've gone through my own life. But I would say that that inquisitiveness, I did because I would, you know, when my parents were saying things around their own values, mm -hmm. um, around social conditioning mm -hmm. and socialisation, mm -hmm. I would speak out. Right. It was like even at a very young right. age, that that didn't that doesn't feel right, right Mum. Right. Why do we have to do this? Right. Why are you saying this? I have a had a really, really strong sense of justice. Mm -hmm. And I think primarily that's because my grandmother, because she was obviously left with quite a newborn mm -hmm. baby, bonded mm -hmm. very closely with my 
sibling who mm -hmm. is just um, a few months, a year and a few months mm -hmm. older than myself. Mm -hmm. So when my parents brought my grandmother over to live in um, the UK mm -hmm. in about 1965, 1966, right. Right. my grandmother did not like me. Right. And I went from actually having an experience of being in a family where I felt part of the mm -hmm. family to being ostracised. So that must have been very, very, very difficult and disorientating. It I was very disorientating. Because mm -hmm. if you can imagine that you had a very strong sense of yourself, mm -hmm. I remember feelings of happiness mm -hmm. and joy as a child. Mm -hmm. I remember holding my dad's hand, mm -hmm. you know, walking around Herne Hill, walking around areas in South London, mm -hmm. going to seaside, mm -hmm. and then it was like, a dark cloud descended mm. on the family mm. in that my my grandmother came with my two older brothers. Mm. But actually, that was really, really exciting for mm. me because my parents told me some fantastic stories mm -hmm. about these wonderful brothers that I had. And you're saying something there that really is fascinating because you said by when you began talking about that, how not unfamiliar, you know, that for many Afro-Caribbean uh, um, uh, uh, families um, in the 50s, 60s, coming here and, you know, not necessarily all being necessarily easy. No, it wasn't easy. Yeah. It and, wasn't then, easy. and then also the family circumstance, not only the, the economic yeah. and the practical or, or prejudice or getting yeah. work and so on, but also some of the family situations were, were complicated. Some part of the family might be abroad and yeah. some part of the family might be here. And that's almost, that could almost be a whole, we could almost explore that as one whole oh, topic. Absolutely. Uh, I'm curious to know then, then, then given all of that, how did, and it's interesting you've already given us these things about, this thing about justice yeah. and this inquisitiveness. Suddenly, as soon as you first of all talked about that justice and you'll sometimes stand up for things and speak out oh. and so, which is very bold in many of those <laughs> kind of family settings, I'm certainly mindful. I suddenly thought, well, I can kind of begin to understand where this thing about being a coach and an interfaith minister might be, oh. can, might be born. How did your career first, um, uh, at first start? How did you make that segue from growing up, your schooling? Yeah. Uh, what happened from school to you begin to find your way in, in, in your career? Well, I left school, it was a girls' grammar school, mm -hmm. and actually it was really the undone thing to leave in the fifth right. form. It was right. almost like you had um, turned your back right. on the whole tradition of going through the school, right. and you'd gone out into the wide world, right. and actually it was one of the best things that I ever did. I actually remember it as quite a liberating moment when I, I actually looked at my mm -hmm. school, I looked at my results for my O-levels mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. I looked at the environment I was in, and mm -hmm. I knew I didn't fit, and I I knew that I wouldn't blossom. Right. I had a really strong feeling of right. that. And I looked around me and I knew I needed to move on. And was that because did you feel as though you knew what your abilities were and you felt as though that wasn't borne out in the results or how you were educated or how you were supported? Or did you just feel as though, mm, I need more from... Because that's quite an... That's quite an in, that's quite an insightful thing yeah. to think and a, and a big kind of decision to yeah. make at that age. It was a big decision because I left really good friends right. that I had cultivated over the five years of mm -hmm. being at school. But I knew that my exam results did not reflect any way my ability. Mm -hmm. um, I knew also that I would be um, channeled into doing something like secretarial studies mm -hmm. because our school tradition was you needed eight or more O levels. Right. That was the norm. Right. And I came in under that. Right. So I knew that my options would have been right. closed off. Right. And I actually had quite a big vision for myself. Right. I loved studying. Mm -hmm. I loved education. Mm -hmm. My dad was really quite prolific in mm -hmm. encouraging me to do well mm -hmm. educationally. And that was in my bones. And right. it was something where again a sense of safety right. was around for me and I knew that I would not fulfill my potential staying. Right and again there's so much there isn't it because you said it was a, a grammar school, it had been a grammar school, is that right? It, was a, it was a grammar it school, was a grammar all my school. way through. So again that kind of discipline and that thing yeah. and that education and then you've got your own expectations and, yeah. and so, so So what was the decision that you made then? How did you begin to find your way in the world, having decided to leave school um, at, at the end of the, uh, of, you know, the fifth year? Yeah, well, I decided that I would go and apply for college. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I think we, she was our sociology teacher, um, and she was quite liberal, and I, I, I must have had a conversation with her. I went to look at the colleges, and my mum came with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
Mm. Sorry, mm. there were no other parents right, yeah, yeah. really going yeah. to enrol their children mm. in um, um, college. Mm. And I don't know what happened, but the head of A levels mm -hmm. looked at me, looked at my mum. I decided that I would put myself through redoing most of my, my O levels mm -hmm. at the time. He said, No way, you don't need to do that. You have the potential to do your A, -le o -level, a levels now. Mm -hmm. What I'll get you to do is do three additional O levels to top mm -hmm. up the O levels mm -hmm. that you did mm -hmm. get, mm -hmm. and you can start your three A levels. That's amazing. And I was like, Oh my God. Wow. That was it. Wow. I literally found my place. Right. And of course, in. Um, in the environment of college, although it was quite difficult, the um, the rivalry, mm -hmm. the who's in the in crowd, mm -hmm. you know, who's mm -hmm. got the most fashionable clothes. Mm -hmm. Actually, I found a bit more of my voice, right. and I found a bit more of myself. Right. And in, in educationally, I really, really enjoyed the challenge. Right, and I, I get that feeling. Interestingly. I get that feeling from you that that still um, exists. I get the feeling that you're a bit. You were saying something before off camera. You said that you weren't. I don't think. You, I think you said something that you weren't a perfectionist. But I get a feeling that there's a bit of you that is a. I don't know if you use that word. I think there's a bit of you that is a perfectionist. I get the feeling that yeah. you you work very hard. You're very yeah, diligent about lots of stuff, and you 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 want things to be as best that they can be, which is a quality that I very much admire because yeah. I don't really look at things necessarily <laughs> through that through that lens. Tell us then, so that's great, you found yourself then yeah. there. How did the, the, what happened that then led you to pick up and become an author and a coach, which, and then an interfaith minister, which of these things emerged first? I get the sense there's a bit of a gap, but how did those things begin to emerge? Because I think lots of people who do know you from these particular worlds yeah. will be curious to know, well, what, what made that transition then between you finding your way then educationally and then how you found this career, which you've been established with in for many years? Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Well, I did a degree in government and politics right. at Birmingham mm -hmm. and I literally sort of got the map of the UK, thought which other city in the world, I mean, sorry, in the UK mm -hmm. is closest to London, mm -hmm. has a, quite a, a strong black community, mm -hmm. would be easy for me to get home mm -hmm. from and it was Birmingham. So mm -hmm. that's where I went. I did my BA in government and politics. Um, my... Um, head of my course trying to get me to go into the police force mm -hmm. I was like mm -hmm. no I know mm -hmm. I don't fit in the police mm -hmm. force and I had my own experiences of the police with some of my my, my one particular brother right. who had been in the criminal justice system right. um, and I had very strong views mm -hmm. about the police that contradicted my own values mm -hmm. about justice and had you at that point had got a sense of what it is that you wanted to do again, I can see the government politics and justice thing. Oh, Did yeah. you have a sense of what you wanted to, to to do at that point or were you still discovering what it is that you wanted to well, do? Well, it's interesting because from um, a child, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. Right. I was terrible at maths. Mm -hmm. I was the only GCSE I did. Mm -hmm. I got grade four. Yeah. It was like that. Right. It felt like quite a long way to mm -hmm. climb up mm -hmm. from grade four, and I just wasn't willing to invest that time. Right, and then when you're going to be teaching maths is one of those. You have to have that as a subject. That, yeah. yeah. So what happened was I came out of um, my degree, and one day I was walking down my local high street, mm -hmm. and there was a youth club there. And when I got home, I said to my mum, "Do you know about that youth club?" And she goes, "Oh, you should go in there and and see whether." they've got any vacancies mm -hmm. in that and I did go in and I did speak to the senior um, youth worker mm -hmm. there and he was um, African Caribbean mm -hmm. he, uh, he was um, running the centre and he just saw my potential his mm -hmm. name was Glenn Scott Thomas mm -hmm. became a fabulous mentor to mm -hmm. me even though he probably would not describe himself as mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. but literally my experience of connecting with Glenn, mm -hmm. he um, recruited me as a um, part-time youth worker. Mm -hmm. I went off and did a, a qualification in part-time youth work. Mm -hmm. I realised I had an, a, a, an ability to develop rapport mm -hmm. and obviously growing up with six brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. I mean you must have some yeah. kind of skills yeah. and strengths that you're able to use with yeah. other and engage with other young people. I found youth work fascinating. Mm -hmm. Writing projects, you know, um, looking at life much more holistically. And what happened was that um, 
Glenn uh, mentored me to go for a full-time youth work post right. over in Hackney. Right. I got the job, mm -hmm. and it just opened up a whole new world. For and me. was that the was that the birthplace of the coaching? Because in the coaching mentoring, here, here you were in this particular situation, going into this particular field. Somebody spotted your talent. You were mentored and supported. Yeah. Or as you say you may not necessarily word it in those particular terms. You were then involved in programs, yeah. helping up people. Was that the birth of you, the coach? Absolutely, and yeah. I, I want to tell you a very mm. quick story about where it really was seeded mm -hmm. there. Um, as part of our professional development as um, youth and community workers, we had something called, we were given, um, in terms of CPD, Continuing Professional mm. Development, uh, they were called, oh, I've forgotten the name, oh, Non-Managerial mm -hmm. Supervisors. Mm -hmm. And I was given um, a black manager and leader who ran her own centre, who was not connected to my organisation. So you were never given somebody who worked in the same organisation that you worked with. So you could have that objectivity, mm -hmm. that you could bring issues around mm -hmm. your professional mm -hmm. practice yes. to those conversations. Yes. And I remember walking into this huge space that we had. Mm -hmm. We had a room that we would use for big groups mm -hmm. and things like that. And we had our first session in there. Mm -hmm. And I remember having the conversation with her. And all of a sudden, it was like there was nobody else in the room. Mm -hmm. It was just me and her. Mm -hmm. And I just felt as if something quite transactional mm -hmm. happened. I was talking about myself. Mm -hmm. I was talking about my work. Right. You said there's something very powerful. There's something, there's something about the so energy in this. powerful yeah. happened. And... She started to affirm me mm -hmm. and she unlocked a key mm -hmm. because there was a part of me that I had shut down due to certain experiences that I'd had mm -hmm. as a child. And she opened a door. Well, that's a wonderful moment where I'm going to pause the camera because clearly I think this is a lovely moment then to talk about the part two of your life and your career where that's so apt because clearly that's what you do yeah. for your work with others, be it as a coach, as a mentor, um, I know you supervise, ironically, coaches yeah. and so on now, and as an author, and, and no doubt too as an interfaith minister, so that's a lovely moment just to pause things, I'll get you to smile at the camera and then I'm looking forward <laughs> to hearing your own take on that, about how it is, how can we unlock that magic and that potential in others. Lovely.